Okay, so the presentation for this one is something students asked me for, and it's good to have two other people to help record this. Uh, just on doing the comparison with university trades or a gap year for someone who's you know graduating high school or considering, you know, maybe they're 16 years old. Face the mic as well. Yeah, it should be good. Let's take it away. So first slide, we're just going to quickly talk about university and then I'll introduce as well Stephanie, who is one of our roommates and has spent about eight to ten years going through university. You got a master's and you didn't go up to the PhD though, but you did multiple programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you spent a considerable amount of time in university. And then obviously Trent and I both spent quite a bit of time in university as well. Like we both have our degrees, but um, took a little more of a roundabout way to finish that's for sure okay so we have some pros and cons up on the screen but you can read those for yourself but first stephanie like you know if someone is in high school and they are considering going into university you know what would you have to say about that um i had a great experience in university but the thing is i changed majors like three times so um, I'd say don't be afraid just picking something that, that you find interesting and don't be afraid to switch later on um, because a lot of times once you start taking the course then you will realize oh maybe you like something else instead so take a wide variety of courses and you'll find something that you're passionate about because it's not fun to study something you're not passionate about. Um, another thing is to make sure uh, it's going into a stream that's somewhat employable because right now a lot of like bachelors of arts and bachelors of science aren't very employable. And then when you try to go find jobs later, they tell you that you're overqualified. So that can be a little bit tricky. Uh, maybe some you can major in something like more employable and minor in something that you really enjoy. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Well, what was when did you find the practicality of your university degree to be after you graduated? Um, that's a really good question. I really liked it. Uh, I was a different person going into university and coming out of university because. In the last three, uh, sorry, the last two years, the third year and fourth year of your undergrad, you do a lot of group work, and that really taught me how to work with people as a team, and also a lot of writing reports. Well, for my degree anyway, so I didn't. Do, do you want to just specify as well, like the programs you went through? Oh yeah, for sure. So I did uh, pre-veterinary studies, and then later I did an animal health majoring in production animals, and then I did a master's in economics. And then, so then going back again to like you study kind of initially veterinary work, working with animals, and you switch to something completely different, more in the business finance mm -hmm. area. What, uh, like, again, what was the practicality of what you were learning in the classroom with what you actually ended up doing? Um, I know if I stayed in uh, animal science, I would, I could get a job, you know, selling pet food or working with animal nutrition. Um, but then I wanted to have a larger impact. And so I got intrigued by policy work. So that's why economics appealed to me. And I was lucky because I got a full ride scholarship. So for my three years of my master's, I got $20,000 a year to study. And that was really, really nice. Um, Which is an important distinction because not everyone gets that. Yeah. Right? So they're taking their $40,000 from their bachelor's and then adding another $20,000 mm -hmm. of debt with their master's, assuming they get it done in a timely fashion that doesn't drag on. Yeah. If I didn't get that scholarship, I don't think I would have done grad school. It's just not worth it. Mm -hmm. Well, and also with your undergraduate, your parents paid for tuition and you lived at home, right? So yeah. there wasn't a lot of expenses going on. That's true. What if you had been having to pay for tuition and you had to be living on your own? would you have looked at it the same way? I think with Asian culture, there was only one path. I was not, not the other two paths weren't apparent to me. But knowing what I know now, um, I, I might have taken a gap year or maybe chosen a different path other than university because currently, um, you know, I work as a math tutor and I'm not using either of my degrees. So, um, and I do think that that's important to consider because even for myself, uh, with my ed degree, although it's very employable, you know, you, when you're taking that money in student loans, like you don't think of it as like, oh, I got to pay this back. It's mm -hmm. just like it, it's, you know, as God Stad would say, it's funny money. You don't really see it, right? It doesn't really do anything. It just shows up, and then it goes to the university, 
and maybe you get like a thousand, two thousand left over to which you, you can party or do whatever you want, right? But now that I'm working, seeing how long it takes to save up ten thousand dollars, to mm -hmm. save up twenty, forty thousand dollars, it's like, okay, like this second time I go back to university, if I do go back, which I'm not saying I will, but it's like, how can I get my employer to pay part of this? How can I get some sort of beneficiary or someone who's willing to pay for me, right? How do I minimize the amount of financial burden on me, right? Because now that I have uh, like some years of experience with slowly earning money, it's, it's, you know, when you're 18, you don't think about that, right? Especially like everything feels slow to you because you've been in this eight hour a day prison for like 12 mm -hmm. years and you don't realize how long it can take you to save up and build yourself up, right? And if you just choose to go from high school to university and you're just like, oh, whatever, screw it. I'll just go to this program that I really like or that I think can get me a job, even though it's hell, that money just disappears. And, you know, it gets tallied up very closely, might I add, at the end of your uh, duration of borrowing. And then they want it back very quickly. Right? And they'll start in putting interest on it. Mm -hmm. It can be very expensive. What were some of the downsides to your university experience? Because um, I know you said, you, like you said, it was very good for you, which was not the case for me. I don't know about Trent, but um, were there any downsides that you saw looking I, back now? Uh, when I finished my master's and I started looking for a job, uh, I worked as an analyst for a little while, but I wanted to change fields because I like working with people rather than data. And so I tried to branch out to, to different types of jobs and, and no one would hire me because they said, you have no work experience and you, you're you overqualified educationally. So I had to leave my education out of my resume in order to try different jobs. So that was interesting. Um, well, that's not something a teacher will tell you like, hey, you might get a master's and realize that that's actually a hindrance to you yeah. succeeding and finding a job. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another one is that, you know, it can be pretty stressful, um, and, but, and, you know, most of the stuff I learned in school, I don't use. And so it was just kind of like time and money <laughs> wasted, mm -hmm. but other than that, I don't feel like I have that many downfalls. Mm -hmm. um, Only 10 years late, but not a big deal. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I really enjoyed my time in university because you meet really, really cool people. And then I joined a whole bunch of student groups and they did really cool initiatives on campus. And yeah, I really liked the environment. It's like just people mm -hmm. on the cutting edge and like really um, bright leaders. And it was uh, also a competitive environment and I love competition. So mm -hmm. it was a really good fit for me. That's something I'll definitely talk more when I organize with Tio Marina. Like Tio was telling me as well, like he, his curiosity what dri is what drives him in his PhD, that like, hey, no one else is studying this, no one else is discovering this, right? It's just me now, fair enough, it might not be very practical, but to explore that aspect of your curiosity or your hobby must feel very nice, right, if that's what you're into. Mm -hmm, but only if it's what you're into. Mm -hmm. If you're not into it, it becomes hell, like right. the last year of my master's. And I'll talk more about that in my video because Tio's time is becoming like hell with his supervisor, oh, okay. right? Like that's a whole, that's a whole other level of um, the bureaucratic aspect of universities because you might actually have to deal with them. Whereas like high schools, you really don't. Mm -hmm. You can get by without any issue. But for a friend of mine in her undergrad, um, you know, her GPA started falling off. She was playing rugby and she was doing all this other stuff. And she had to essentially go to like a university court and like testify why she, she should be allowed to continue to stay at the university and not just told to like beat it. You know, this is halfway through, this is $20,000 in, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, like she was failing, fair enough, but it wasn't like, you know, they're just judging you based off your grade. They're not even like looking at like, okay, you play for our athletics, you know, you volunteer in the community and you're managing multiple courses and you have a job, right? Or whatever it is. Right. They just look at you like a statistic, which can be very dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. right? But on the flip side, like if you choose to, because I tell my students, like, hey, take less courses and get involved in campus activities, like join some like recreation team and like participate in events and like talk to people in your classes. It can be a very fun time as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I, I want to say like, I really enjoyed my time in there, but I don't know if the outcome was necessarily worth worth all the cost that was put into it. Because it, it was a fun time, but 
uh, depending on the degree you choose, it, it could end up, you know, not being building towards the future you actually want. Mm -hmm. It's very important to consider. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, I can add to that. Okay. So my thoughts on university is that the courses, I'd say 90% of them are useless. Like <laughs> just, Maybe 95. Yeah, very, yeah, and a lot of it depended on the teacher, and a lot of it depended on if they had some flexibility. Like I had a consulting course with a teacher who actually did consulting in the oil sands and stuff like that, worked with companies. And I really enjoyed her class, but she, I'd also had other classes with her, and it, just because the curriculum was useless, it just wasn't. Like, I liked her class, but it just didn't really teach me any real-world skills. And so what I actually really enjoyed from the class is we had to go find a business for consulting, basically pitch them on consulting services, write up contracts, get it signed, and then provide those services. So it's very real-world based. Um, but most courses aren't. Um, like, I really like economics, but it was really just like kind of stroking the ego on an intellectual side of like, hey, we have to talk about these ideas, but these ideas in the most part are useless. So mm -hmm. the actual course part of it isn't worth it at all, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. It's it only be if you actually needed it because you're in an industry, like if you need to be a lawyer or something like that, or an educator, you actually need those criteria that it makes any sense at all. Um, but you, to me, you'd want, actually want to test that and see as much early as possible, do you like this? That's one of the things I like about trades is that you go to school for six months or so, and then you actually have to go work Not for six, six weeks. Months. Six weeks? Yeah, six right? weeks. Like your first, your whatever the color system is, the first one can be a six-week certificate, mm -hmm. and then you have to go and do that type of work in the field for like six months. Right? Mm -hmm. And then you actually have to see, is this something that I want to keep going with? And then it's just a small taste because, like, you mean paying for six weeks of courses. I'm not sure what the price is, but it's very reasonable, especially because you'd make all that money back just in the six months you'd have to work for it. And then additionally, like with Walid, like who I'll eventually do an interview with, but if your grades are reasonable, you can essentially get a scholarship that pays it off because mm -hmm. it's so cheap. It's like pennies mm -hmm. for the government, right? Interesting. Like my cousin Walid, who is running a auto body shop, who I talk about often, but. He essentially had his whole Red Seal auto body paid for because, you know, he could just do well enough academically in the course, mm -hmm. right? So actual course wise, I'd say university is a complete waste of money. Um, <laughs> and especially you're talking about like student loans and stuff like that. They're very easy to get into them. And there's like, I max mine out with full $60,000. Um, for most people working, even if you got like a good job, let's say paying $25 an hour or plus, I'd say most people would struggle to save about a hundred to two hundred dollars a month, even just to be able to accumulate that just based on current expenses. So basically, like assume that you're going to be able to put a hundred dollars a month to paying off your debt, let's say extra or something like that. So count up how much that that is, and then see how many years you're going to be paying for this. And that's not even assuming that you're saving for retirement. So it's mm -hmm. like let's say you spend five to seven years in school. Then it takes you maybe another five to ten years to potentially pay off that debt, if not longer. And then you're looking at being 35, 40 years old before you can even start potentially saving money for retirement or whatever it is that you're looking to do, buying a house. Um, so the financial economics of a university degree, to me, seem completely garbage. Um, but what I do like about university is the environment. So I like being on campus. In particular, I much prefer U University of Alberta versus Grant McEwen. Um, Grant McEwen was a very nine to five school. It's like, I'd say a good percentage of students live in Sherwood Park in St. Albert and they bus in, they bus out. And then so at like nine o'clock, everybody's there. And then by five o'clock, everybody's gone. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. And so campus is dead. What I really liked about the University of Alberta is campus is always going. It's like, you could go to sub kind of like the central place at midnight and there's still going to be people around. There's going to be a like, party going on, there's right? Like there's going to be a party. Yeah. Right? There's going to be people stuff. busy. So there's there's an energy to being at the university of like, you mean young, lots of attractive people, lots of people having fun, lots of parties and stuff like that. So I definitely really appreciate that. And like to me, what would be more interesting is like if you got a job on campus, like if you, even if you're working at like the coffee place or something like that, you could still actually join a lot of these different groups or even just to kind of attend. Some are going to be tricky, like they actually need you to be in university. But a lot actually are pretty flexible and a lot of events are pretty flexible. Like you could go to like the different parties, you could hang out with a lot of different people. Um, 
and so you could actually be making money while getting to be in the environment. Um, and then like Stephanie said, I, th I feel like the student groups are actually one of the most beneficial parts of it. So I was part of a fraternity, and even though I was a grant McEwen student, I got to be a part of the University of Alberta fraternity, and that was very valuable. I like learned leadership, I got to play sports, connected with other guys, learned more about women. So that was very valuable as well. But the actual university economics, to me, just don't make any sense. So yeah. you want to you want to break those two apart. No, I agree. Um, I mean, there was a lot there. I don't know if I'll add to, but I think you covered a lot of the bases that socially speaking, like, yeah, university can be an awesome time, right? You're mm -hmm. around young people who are intelligent, who are like, in a sense, they're looking forward to their future. They're trying to plan for their future, although you know, going to university might not be the best place for that. But um, another thing I'd like to add to is you're, if you're a smart person, like if you have an IQ of about 120 above, it's very nice being around the university because you're around other smart people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to Grant McEwen, I'd say the average IQ is about 110. And if you go to Nate, I'm guessing about 100. Um, so it's like if you're a really smart person, like I went to Grant McEwen, but I didn't really like Grant McEwen people for the most part. In particular, Grant McEwen girls, I did not like at all because they're all focused on their appearance. Like instead of spending that time learning and getting smarter, mm -hmm. they kind of spent those hours a day how to look prettier and stuff like that. So I'd say Grant McEwen had much more like attractive women. But the University of Alberta women I actually could talk with and enjoy interacting with. And that's a very big thing. So like for me on my gap year, I was surrounded by smart other friends in school because that's kind of what happens in high school is you get sectioned off into your, your intelligence level. But then when I went to work for a year at a grocery store and then with my dad, it's like I was no longer around those smart people and life gets to look really boring if you are a smart person. And it was kind of... Uh hinting at that with some students as well. It's like, you know, you're in a small school and it filters for everyone. And so like the people around you aren't going to value and be attracted to the traits that you have per se. But if you change your environment, all of a sudden, like you're in a much better position because you're more suited to that environment. Now, obviously, as Trent was saying, like if you can work on campus or work with campus, you can still be in that environment surrounded by those people and not have to suffer like, you know, $10,000 a year of debt and mm -hmm. numerous courses, which can be incredibly stressful. And, you know, one thing my students hate about my class is like, Hey, how are you going to mark this? Like, well, I don't know. I'm just mark it. Right. Mm -hmm. That's literally every university course. I would say every paper I wrote, there was no rubric. There was no, like, here's how you can do well. It's simply like hand in your assignment on this day and you'll get a mark sometime within two weeks. Right. And maybe you could go and discuss with that professor and maybe they'd be willing to like boost you up. Right. So it can be very difficult dealing with that kind of stress in that environment. So if you can get that experience, the social aspect of it without necessarily having to be there when you're 18, 19 and not sure what you want to be doing, it's like it's a tremendous benefit. Right. Like even if you're working as a barista on campus and you overhear people talking about like, oh, man, like I really don't like this program for X, Y, Z reason. And I'm thinking about switching. Like you can see and learn through their through them peripherally, like how difficult it is to switch a program, right? Like you probably didn't have a problem, Stephanie, because your GPA was high. I'm assuming, right? So like, I think at the U of A, if you want to switch programs, like you need above like a 3.5, 3.6 GPA, and that's like that can be difficult to do. Like you have to be very industrious and diligent towards your grade to get that, right? Like you can't unless you're just stupid smart. Like you're not going to get that just by pissing around. Right. Yeah, a big thing is like Stephanie is both incredibly intelligent, so I'd say she's around 140 IQ, um, which is probably only about three to four percent of the population, and she's incredibly industrious too. Like in particular, at that time, very hardworking and would study like countless hours. And one of the problems I see with what we do with smart kids is we all funnel them into the same jobs. It's like, hey, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer, you should be an engineer, you should be kind of any of those kind of series, and that's basically like that's the only options for smart people and to me that's very ridiculous it's like if you want to go into the healthcare field it's like it'd be better to go work at an old folks home you mean just get a basic job do you mean going through could be serving food could be anything like that it's like okay do i if i want to go into healthcare do i want to be working with old people because old people some people can love them and some people can hate them because they got you mean you can be old complainy and then to me, it's like, okay, try childcare and do a year of working for that. And okay, do I enjoy childcare? And then, okay, what about 
sick people because working with sick people is very different than necessarily working with people who are proactive about their health. So one, you could be going to a chiropractor and it's like these tend to be much more positive people who are trying to be proactive about their health. Whereas if you go to like a medi center and you work as like um, a secretary or something like that, you're getting to see kind of what most doctors are actually dealing with is like, they're mm -hmm. just kind of anybody who's come off the street, they're not paying anything for this. And they're, you mean, they've got a whole bunch of health issues and they're not looking to do anything to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing could be for set for a lawyer and stuff like that. So it's, to me, it's like, you want to experiment and recognize too, it's that, it would be better to go off and have tried five or 10 different jobs over like the period from 18 to 25 years old, in my opinion, and then find a field that is actually interesting to you. So it's like, okay, I did some work in engineering and stuff like that. And I helped out and I was whatever. I just did basic level jobs, but I really like the environment. I like the people that were here. I like what we were doing. And I like being able to help out as much as possible. Then you get the side benefit that they might actually pay for what you're doing. But then you just, you've got so much more perspective of like, why am I doing this? Why am I here? Um, and not just kind of following the track of everybody like, hey, I have to be a doctor because I want to help people. Mm -hmm. It's like smart people can be valuable in any area of society. Like you could be on a pavement crew for the city of Edmonton and having a smart person who knows how to maintain the machine, how to get everybody operating effectively, you know, all kind of stuff is just as valuable in my opinion. So you kind of have to figure out what actually makes you happy and what, and I think what you need to do to is actually experiment for that. And I'll finish, I'll add that with like, particularly with the university. Uh, I was talking to Tio about this, my friend, but you know, you don't know if, like even if you're very smart and you want to do that cutting edge research, like you don't know if that's the place where you're going to be happy because the thing about that PhD level intelligence is that those people are so smart in that one area that they're probably lacking in numerous other areas in life. Like they might not even know how to talk to a person properly. Mm -hmm. And if you're someone who is very intelligent, very hardworking, very social and has other hobbies, like being in an environment where other people kind of like live these alien lives can feel very alienating. It's like, I don't relate to anyone that I work with, mm -hmm. right? It can be very difficult, right? But just adding on to that, like, Sometimes it's better to be in that tangible real world where you're physically doing the work rather than the abstract where university takes you of like, here's the theory behind the work, right? Like going through a nursing program is going to be very different than being on shift, right? You, you're going to learn a lot of useful information in your program, but being on shift will teach you things that the program won't talk about, right? Like how do you, how do you deal with old people politics? If two people meet in the hallway and they're not budging, like how do you solve that problem? Like, is there even a university course for that? Right. Mm -hmm. But that's stuff that you're going to have to deal with. You have to ask yourself before you decide to get into a four year, 40, $50,000 nursing programs. Like, is that what I want to deal with for maybe, you know, one to three years after I graduate before I move into, let's say like a hospital or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next section. Cause I okay, feel I'll like just have one more comment and then I'm going to leave. Um, and like, you know, I, I did it a 4.0 GPA throughout the, for years, but uh, I just wanted to add that even though I was good at studying, it was not a transferable skill. Like employers don't reward you for that. No one really cares about your GPA. They care about your work experience. And I actually got my first two jobs at a university not because of my grades, but because of the connections I built while volunteering for student groups and things. So um, yeah, grades aren't everything. That's just what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Anyway, peace out. All right, thank Thanks. you, Stephanie. Uh, we'll continue on with uh, just talking about gap years. So this is something that both Trent and I have done uh, in various ways. Um, I think it should be fine. But uh, again, you can see the pros and cons on screen, and I'll most likely share this um, PowerPoint in the in the video uh, explanation. But you need to turn off as well. Um, but yeah, so a lot of students, a lot of you have asked me or mentioned to me that you want to take a gap year and it's definitely something I support, but I certainly agree that there's a good way to do one and there's a bad way to do one. Like mm -hmm. there, there are levels to gap years. And so uh, because I traveled and I did that part way through university, I've met a lot of people who are 18 years old doing gap years and, um, you know, some of and like a lot of them choose to travel, which I do think is, is still a smart choice, but 
there were some people who did the touristy travel, like mom and dad paid for the entire trip and they're going to hotels and they're partying and whatnot. But there are other people, like I remember this one girl I met, Stella, she was 18. She was from the Netherlands. Like she volunteered with this program called Workaway. And so I met her while working at a hostel. And, you know, in that hostel, she had to deal with this, or we all had to deal with this, like, uh, lady who owned the hostel who just would tell us what she wanted done, but not teach us how to do it or show us where any of this stuff was. And she would get quite rude. And so kind of the day we decided to leave was like she had made that girl cry because she was yelling at her. And it's experiences like that that teach you like, okay, this is the real world. Like when you're in high school, like a teacher can't yell at you. They can't swear at you. Like they're very limited by what they can do to you and treat you. But in the real world, like those limitations are much like they're significantly reduced. And so you get to experience, let's say, the more vile side of people. Like if you think you have bad teachers and you, you think you don't like being around them, wait till you're around a boss who has a power trip and thinks that you're their slave, right? Like that sucks. Mm -hmm. So for this girl, you know, first she had that experience in the hostel and it was, it kind of sucked, but it taught her like how to stand up for herself and how to have courage to leave when you're in a crappy situation. Altogether, we went to this villa kind of further in Greece and we had a really laid back host and it's like okay like this is more like self-directed learning and working and what does that feel like and then after that she went on to the island of Crete and she helped this like family's farm like with the olive season so she was picking olives and it's like okay like are you going to pick olives as a real job no but you get to go into this brand new experience and you have to rapidly learn how to adapt to that environment and how to be successful which is essentially what's going to give you success long term throughout life mm -hmm. you know the more quickly you can adapt adjust improvise in the correct manner it's going to support you so there are definitely good ways to do a gap year and there's definitely bad ways to do a gap year um and so i guess that's just the opening thoughts on it was there anything else you wanted to add or where would you like to take this um so one thing that i think through is that with jobs we tend to think about what am i getting here like what am i getting paid all that kind of stuff um, but I think it's better to think about what am I becoming here? So what kind of person am I becoming through these experiences? And so generally a, a broader range of experiences is more valuable. Cause like when I got a job, like I applied to the grocery store in town and you I mean, I was pretty reluctant and afraid to do it cause I had really had a job that, um, was like that before. And then they basically like hired me on the spot and it's like, okay. So I kind of stayed there for six months and in hindsight, there was not much to have learned from that six months. You mean, it's like, it would have been better to have spent three weeks or something like that while I was still applying for other jobs and maybe got like a landscaping job and got like, if I had spent that year getting 20 different jobs or whatever, like a few years and trying out different industries and seeing what I like. To me, that would have been a lot more valuable than that stability of like, hey, I show up, make the money and stuff like that. Because um, when you're young, what it's really about is finding your niche, like finding what, what do you want to do? What do you want to like all that kind of stuff. So it's like, if you think of like a young athlete, like somebody who's got lots of potential, in a lot of cases, it would be better, it'd be good for them to like, okay, I want to experiment a little bit with soccer, experiment with basketball, experiment with football, see what's actually a good fit for me. And then you can kind of nicheify after you've tried all the sports, you've got a feel for what's actually a good fit for your, your personality type. Cause you might spend five years playing a sport and then just by chance you play this other sport and you recognize like, Oh, this is so much more fun. Like I'm much better with my feet than I am with my hands or something like that. Um, so as a young person, what you really want to do is experiment and try out different things and tr kind of like, so it could be experimenting with traveling and kind of seeing who you are. To me, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of traveling because um, in a lot of ways, I feel like it can be a form of running away. Um, but it's like how Najib used it. It's like it was very transformational and he went through a lot of hard times and got to know himself better in a lot of degrees. Um, but a job can be the exact same thing. It's that you just find this job and you just stick to it and you're not improving yourself. and You're not whatever. And one of the things too is that we live in a world that you can be self-educated like let's say 150 years ago when university was kind of like more so getting started and becoming a bigger thing it was really hard to learn you mean it's like books were expensive and you mean to find people who are actually knowledgeable on a topic you kind of had to go to university to get mm -hmm. access to the books to get access to the smart people 
but now it's like everything's freely available. Like you have YouTube channels that are free that are giving better kind of university information and stuff like that, that they're actually doing it. So it could be teaching about how to invest in real estate or it could be how to, you mean, buy stocks and bonds. Well, even for like any student watching this who have to sh- go through the struggle, which we all do, of like, oh man, my teacher does not a teaching subject. Mm-hmm. Like just the other day, I was sitting with some grade 12s and they were, they were doing calculus and they basically had a video on of how to do this style mm-hmm. of question. They're just following along, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, there's probably a, a thousand dudes teaching calculus on YouTube and maybe a hundred of them are doing it very well and like mm-hmm. 10 are very famous. And it's like, you can really get that top notch mm-hmm. um, experience. Like, and, and because YouTube is so ubiquitous, it's like, it's so easy for people to put their material out there and for you to get access to it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like think about like, if you're a basketball player, like getting into a Michael Jordan training camp, would be so expensive right now because everyone knows who Jordan is or LeBron James, right? Whereas, you know, in other areas, so like other sports that are less developed, so Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I was talking to my friend about this. Mm -hmm. You know, he went to a seminar for three hours with a guy who's won the world championship at his weight five times in his life. Like that's like Michael Jordan level Mm -hmm. professionalism. You know, so YouTube is that access. It, it, It lets you access the best professors and the best like educators, the best people in this field, assuming they're actually making the content. Right. And the big thing too is that we live in a world of kind of economic scarcity in that we pay for the things that are rare and valuable that are hard to get. And so the idea that you're going to become rare and valuable and hard to get because you go to school and learn exactly what everybody else is learning is completely ridiculous. Um, Like one of the things we have our friend Rosh, who is a chiropractor, and she kind of realized once you go through school that they never taught you anything important. Like they never taught you how to get clients. They never taught you how to do how to hire, how to manage, how to run a business, all these kind of things. Um, and those are actually the valuable skills, in particular marketing. So like, how do you actually get clients? Like that's a business. Like that's something that virtually all businesses are looking to continually improve. And then how to sell clients too. So like those are like universally valuable skills that virtually nobody actually learns. And if you are able to master those skills and like leadership and management and hiring or other great skills to have, then you actually become rare and valuable. Um, and that's what ideally you want as a life because the, the more valuable you become, the more money you can, your hourly rate is. Mm-hmm. And so you can get more freedom because like if you're able to make 40 or $50 an hour and you don't have very many expenses like I do with my tutoring business, it makes, it gives me a tremendous amount of freedom that I could work for two hours a day and basically cover all my like expenses for that day. And then I've got the rest of the time free and mm-hmm. I haven't spent any time traveling. I haven't had any expenses, or anything like that. It's just like, I get to do my life. And mm-hmm. then also with the investing in education, it's like, I was willing to buy courses for myself. So like I paid, like, I think it was like $1,500 for a Google AdWords course because I'd read his book, the book was good, and I was recognizing that our business that I was working in really could value, like, get a lot of value from Google AdWords. And so I was willing to invest in this course, even though my boss wasn't willing to, like, I could pitch him on it, but he just didn't see it. It's like, oh, like, why, and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, so that, to me, was far more valuable than spending five, seven hundred dollars whatever it is for a university course that you mean never really has any use and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's like that willingness into investing yourself, I think is really it, big. It, and I would say that that speaks to the difference between the old school and the new school, right? Like for me telling my students and you know, some of them challenge me on this and I think it's absurd, but they're like, Hey, like how come you're the only teacher who's okay with us looking at Wikipedia? It's like, well, cause I recognize what a valuable resource it is. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, and I've talked to a few people about this and they all agree, like you could probably rely on Wikipedia for up to 100 level courses, maybe even 200 level courses, like second year courses in university, mm-hmm. right? For, especially depending on the particular subject. Like sure, if it's about a celebrity, that's different, but that's not anything useful anyways, right? If you wanna learn about some historical event or a particular field, like you can get so much information just off Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they branch out and they give you all this information, right? And so it's that old school mindset of like, what do you mean you're going to pay $1,500 for an internet course about AdWords? Like Mm -hmm. you should be going to school. You should be going to McEwen for a program on marketing and advertising. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the sooner you recognize in your own life that like, Hey, knowledge is 
readily available in numerous formats. Some of my students laugh at me like, oh, Mr. K's a podcast guy. Like, you're goddamn right I'm a podcast guy because the people who have valuable information to share that's practical, like they're getting invited to these podcasts where people want to interview them. Like, hey, tell me more about your book. Tell me more about your field. Like I was just listening to a lot of God Saad recently who's like a, like a top-notch world-level uh, evolutionary biologist or psychologist and has done so much research and has written numerous books and is very successful. And it's like that guy's giving his information for free mm -hmm. to hell with whatever is like being taught in my high school, right? Because it mm -hmm. doesn't even compare. It's a whole different level. Yeah, like he already is a university lecturer and he's putting up these videos and stuff like that on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so you can get that university lecture for free and you're not going to necessarily get um, the degree at the end of it that is going to help you get hired, but you can actually get that education. And education, we have this idea now that we've related to job skills and there really should be two different things. Like what you're supposed to get from a bachelor of arts is basically like an understanding of human history, understanding how to read, how to write, how to communicate. And these different skills um, most universities aren't effectively teaching that anymore um, and for the most part that's not necessarily employable it's not going to help you get a job like what like I've been on like the hiring side where we're hiring people and basically what business owners want is they want experience like they want experience and they want people who are going to be good with people like mm -hmm. they want people who are good with the other employees good with customers things like that and those are really the two biggest things. So like, are you likable? Do you have direct job experience? And so for the most part, going and getting a university degree isn't going to help this. It's like, I would much prefer to have somebody just come in, um, do a base level job and do it really well. Like be willing to stay a little late, come a little early, ask to learn new skills, you mean, and just help, like look around, how do I make this business better? Right, so I was going to emphasize, like I didn't read this news article, but I saw this thing about... Uh how in the future employers are going to be looking more for soft skills rather than hard skills, right? So the soft skills, is, as was mentioned, like how likable are you? You know, how well do you work with people or can, are you social, right? Do you know how to properly engage in social environments and all these softer things that you can't necessarily learn, but you can have, right? Or you can't necessarily sit in a classroom and be taught. It's tricky, right? Like you can obviously find material on it, but, um, you know, just connecting this with like, I recently went through uh, one of my uh, recommendation letters of recommendation from a different school um, and just reading through it because it had been a while since I looked at it. And I don't think I read the whole thing the first time, but one of the things they really emphasized was like Najib demonstrates that he values relationships because he takes the time to talk to every single staff member. Like that's just something I do. It's a soft skill. Like I talk to everyone, but for them to have written that down in like, hey, this is why we'd recommend this guy for employability because he is very intentional about these certain things, not only with staff members, but also with students. And it has nothing to do with like the classroom teaching. It's like, hey, he, he like breaks down his ideas really carefully at an understandable level. Because I do think I struggle with that. Sometimes I remain in the abstract realm. Mm -hmm. What they really emphasize is like, hey, this guy is like really a team player and he connects people. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not something university taught me. That's not something my GPA reflects. My GPA was kind of trash, but mm -hmm. you know, we don't really care about that. Right. Not a single employer has looked at that, but what they have looked at is like, okay, how does this guy present himself in an in a, in a interview? Right. Mm -hmm. How are they at, at the work as well? Right. And to me too, it's like how, like trying to get jobs through resumes is pretty useless. It's like, you really want to get through people. Like, I think back to so many of the people we hired that we actually enjoyed, it was like there were referrals, like there were referrals from other employees, there were referrals from our suppliers, things like that. Um, whereas when we just put up a job application and get in a hundred resumes, it's overwhelming. Like there's no way to actually know who's going to be a good fit, who's not. Um, and so it's very tricky. Like I, I know we even ended up hiring like a hiring company that did, does that kind of selection process for us. So to kind of think through these things, you really have to think outside the box to have success, in my opinion, mm -hmm. in the modern world. Yeah, so there's two points I want to emphasize. So on the pros, the number seven, going on your hero journey, and then on the cons, kind of the idea of like feeling behind, number three. But uh, I would continue to emphasize like 
a gap year can really be an adventure, right? Like you just, you, you, you develop all these other character traits and skills, if you're intentional about it, that puts you at an advantage over everyone else that's not on paper, right? Like you, you can't look at a resume and know that, oh, this person's courageous, right? You can't look at a GPA and know that this person's risk-taking, you know, or that they handle themselves well under pressure, right? Um, and, and those are traits that are very valuable in the human world. Right. And, and whatever else there is like, hey, this person's honest, right? This person in, has integrity. They're reliable, mm -hmm. right? So being able to go on your own hero's adventure and developing all the aspects of yourself that school fails to develop, because really, I mean, even in high school and university, they're basically training you to sit down, process information, regurgitate it on a test. Mm -hmm. And that's not very a valuable skill. It's not a very admirable thing either. It's like, sure, it's good for understanding what you need to do, but as I've as I've learned over the years with me developing my soft skills, it's like there are times where in PD day meetings, like, I don't even have to pay attention. I can just ask somebody afterwards for the spark notes. Huh. They'll tell me exactly what we're supposed to do. It's like, okay, cool. Like I didn't have to listen to somebody yammer on for an hour for like a two sentence phrase. That's going to tell me the task. Right. Mm -hmm. So developing those soft skills of like having that courage to ask someone just honestly saying like, Hey, you know, I wasn't really listening or paying attention. Can you just tell me what we're supposed to do? right um also on the ladder quite like so there's this idea that we climb up the ladder like being behind and stuff like that and i think it's a very outdated mentality and idea it's like we don't climb a corporate ladder it's not like you go to mcdonald's and you start the the bottom and you during you work your way up it's like you're trying to shift and you're going to different places on a continual basis um and so you kind of have to let go of that because like people who do kind of have that ladder mentality i find often will get to 30 or 40 or 50 years old and realize that they got to, they are climbing the wrong ladder it's like you get to a certain Don't point break it's down. Like, yeah it's like hey i've been a lawyer but i hate being a lawyer and like the only reason i'm still a lawyer now is because i want to be financially free and it's like so you invested 10 years of schooling and 10 years of your life you mean to end up at like 45 recognize you don't even want to do this and it's like that's rough you know right and then the other aspect of that left behind like you know, i tell my i tell students all the time it's like oh my god if i were to go to university now i'd make a killing like i know how to dress i know how to take care of myself i know how to study i know how to like pay attention mm -hmm. i'm much i'm much more knowledgeable now it's like i can do things much easier now than i could have at 18 and i think if you're taking care of yourself like i mean that age is kind of irrelevant the only relevance is that you had maybe ten, like if you go to school at 28 rather than 18 and you've taken yourself taking care of yourself in the last 10 years, like you're just going to do so much better than the people around you. Cause you have so much more knowledge and experience, right? You might struggle in certain ways. Like it might be difficult to get back into that school mentality and like the schedule and kind of conforming to your nonsense of the professor, whatever it is. But in many other respects, like you're going to do well cause you've been taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. like you've been, you've been educating yourself on your own. Right. So uh, the feeling behind is really just kind of, Inter in internal like and you need to solve that there right like i had one guy who joined the fraternity he was like around 25 or something like that and he had been in the military and still was and he was you know, getting a degree paid for by the military and he was a man it's like virtually everybody else i looked at in the fraternity were boys like there was like one or two others that kind of were like wanting to become men but it's like i honestly knew it's like hey this guy actually you mean has his stuff together he actually has some real world experience he was already married but if he wasn't, you mean he could have, you mean got with girls, you could have, you mean all this kind of stuff. It did, he did struggle because the military was so structured and university was so unstructured. It's, it's hard to make that transition, but it's like, as a guy, for the most part, you only get better. And it's like, as you get more experience and more perspectives, you're going to be able to run circles around other guys. If you're going to university at 25 years old, if you've got money in the bank, you've got a car, you've got experience, you've got perspective, you've got soft skills, people skills, all that kind of stuff. If you come back to university, it's like you're not behind. It's like you're so far ahead and it's like so much easier and so much more enjoyable than you mean all these people who come out of university and they're still boys. Like they still don't really know themselves. They don't haven't gone through hard things, all these kind of stuff. Um, I mean, boy or boy or girl, right? Like you can be like. A an child, 18 year old yeah. girl and go through university and still be a child right exactly. and not taking responsibility and accountability mm -hmm. and not like sorting out your own self right so i th 
So just to wrap up the gap here, I think like, you know, if you set some sort of plan, some sort of purpose or mission you're trying to accomplish, like really think of it like a, like a quest, right? Like, Hey, I'm going to gain, and it doesn't have to be too grand, right? Cause you can say, okay, like I'm going to get a job. Cool. You finish that quest. And you realize, wait a minute, like there's another layer to this quest. Like there's more lore. Like as you go on, it's like, okay, like I could get a second job. Hey, I could explore this field. I just met someone at a work event and they're offering me to go here and then, Maybe on the side, you say, hey, like, I don't really like the way I dress. Like, some of my clothes are tattered. They're old. They don't fit me. Like, okay, like, let's go on that quest and figure that out. And then maybe, you know, now that you're 18, 19, 20, you've been high, to high school for like a year or two, and you're struggling with your dating life, it's like, okay, well, like, let's figure that out as well. That's another quest. And if you spend like two to five years doing that, like, you know, the gap year or years can really be the ultimate game changer between you and everyone around you right while they're kind of going through university being treated like like you know 18 to 22 year old children and not adults or you know your other friends you chose to just like laze around and not really take any responsibility or accountability or stay at the same spot like you will slowly start to see your boat shifting in a direction you want it to be going in and you'll start to see yourself making a lot of uh traction moving forward okay we'll move on we'll talk about trades so um it's not something i currently have but mm -hmm. is something that i've sincerely considered like time and time again especially on the days where it's like okay this annoying kid is bothering me mm -hmm. or like i have to deal with this silly bureaucratic issue that the school won't solve because the school is insert comments i can't say <laughs> um you know, or the school system rather, not the particular school, but um, great example. I tried to start a boxing club because I see that that would be very useful and not even boxing, hitting other students, but just hitting pads and to see that the school system had already built in into their documents that that was a hard no, just seemed very soul crushing to me. It's like, hey, this is something that would really help the most difficult young men at the school to succeed and do better. So it's very complicated. So. I have seriously considered trades, but right now I really like where I am. So with Trent, like you haven't done trades either, but uh, but I do have both my brothers did the trades, um, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of family and the kind of stuff that have done that. And to me, the trades make a lot of sense, especially if you're moderate intelligence. Like if you're not like the top of your class, like at eighty-five plus percent. Generally, I see the trades being a lot more effective, and especially for boys. Is that my brothers both struggled through school and like had tutors throughout the whole time, but never really got it. Um, and it was tough to see why exactly that was happening. But once they got into the trades, they actually flourished. Like they, you mean, really enjoyed the classes, got very good grades. They loved going to work and kind of actually do something with their hands and do something practical. Like both my brothers love the work that they do. Um, and you kind of have to figure out, like, if you're a very intellectual person, the trades is going to be a tricky place to be in because you're going to be around lower IQ people. And it's, you mean, there's going to be a lot of issues. Like, there's going to be things like drugs and alcohol and uh, steroids is another issue. Like, um, Interesting. Yeah, because a lot of people, and d depending on what trade it is, like, the oils, oil uh, field has a lot of testosterone, like, steroids that they're adding. And it really it really puts people through a loop. Like, um, it puts them very emotionally unstable. They can cry, they can fight, they can, they're just not sound in a lot of, in my perspective. And like how like, they say, like they're compromised, right? Yeah. Cause they're not in their natural state. So they'll, they'll just like snap at the smallest thing. And it's, it's just very strange to be around. So there's a lot of issues to, even if you're a smart person, if you do go into that trade, if you actually learn how to be a good manager and how to you mean get good staff and how to keep them and stuff like that you could run an extremely profitable business um you mean for like uh, as long as the sun shines yeah right? it, it's kind of like unlimited because you just don't have smart people going into the trades like all the smart people are trying to compete in these niche industries of doctor lawyer and all that kind of stuff but it's like if you're smart and you're actually hard working and responsible and stuff like that it's like you can very easily create a great business. Right, like your Red Seal electrician program. If you're smart, you're forward thinking, you're thinking about, okay, like first I'm going to save my money, then I'm going to learn a little bit on the business, marketing end, and then I'm going to have my own business. Your electrical certificate could get you more than an electrical engineer. 
time percentage. Right. And sure, the electrical engineer on the top side might have like upwards of 150, 250K a year. But mm -hmm. then again, like you're like one out of 10,000 people, maybe 100,000 people doing that. And it's like, as we were already talking about, it's like, what kind of life do you really want to live, right? How do you want your business to be conducted and how much work-life balance do you want to have, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, whereas if you get into that electrician and develop your own business and have a couple of guys, like electrical work is something that's always going to be needed, mm -hmm. right? And you can have a very high ceiling of earning potential and balance that with like living a, let's say, a comfortable life where, you know, you can have access to your hobbies or raise a family or do this and do that. Right? Yeah, it's very rare to have somebody who is intelligent, is able to solve problems, honest, integrity and stuff like that. Like that is a very limited supply in the world. Like I know like one of our installers for one of the companies I worked for, he was basically like lying for a number of years where it's basically like he was clock saying that he was clocking out at like seven o'clock at night or something like that. Like, oh, we just got slammed. But once we got a new van and there was like tracker installed, it turns out he was like cutting out at like 2.30 and going to the gym and working out and then just building for an extra four hours. And it's like, so in a lot of these trades and industries and stuff like that, there's just so many character flaws and so many people that just don't show up. They don't do what they say they're going to do and stuff like that. So if you can just be somebody who is honest, integrity, you mean all that kind of stuff, you can charge premium prices and you can like, you mean have customers that will stay with you forever. What I will say about that is like, if you want to be honest in that industry, like you kind of have to aim towards being your own boss. Like my mm -hmm. friend Imran, who drives a truck, eventually I'll have a video with him as well. But like, he tells me of the companies he deals with. And it's like, sometimes that scumbag owns the company mm -hmm. and they will rob you out of your pay. They'll like hassle you left, right and center over like random things. That's their fault as well. Yep. So it's it, like, it does have its challenges. And a lot of them are like people challenges, which, you know, and people challenges exist everywhere, right? Yeah. But I think that the trades kind of avoid maybe that like utility challenge. Like, you know, if you are a plumber, like everyone needs plumbing. If you're an electrician, people need that. Mechanic, auto body, a painter, you know, even if you go into the culinary side, like you could be a chef, right? And, and that's another thing. I think you and I have a tendency to think of trades as like plumbing, electrician, mechanic, but like, you know, if you're a girl and you don't really know what you want to do, but you like being around people, it's like, well, being a nail salon tech, right? Mm -hmm. Or like uh, someone who cuts hair, even if you're a guy, right? It doesn't really matter, right? But going into the service industry as well of like, you're going to provide these small services to people. Mm -hmm. Even through that, like there's so many different opportunities and options. Yeah. And they stay in the practical realm. So if someone's hiring you, they know that, okay, like, this person went to this program. This program's pretty decent. They actually teach people hands-on how to do this work. If we hire this person, there's a good chance they're going to know how to do the work. With the university, you simply don't know what you're getting, right? Like, as Trent mentioned, like, you could, like I could have lied right through my teeth about my, um, my contacts, previous places I've worked. There's, like, real no way of knowing, mm -hmm. right? And so, in some regards, I got very lucky that the district I work for now had some like pretty easy hiring practices. Like they were just really looking for uh, substitute teachers. But then from there, it was all those other skills that helped me to get consistent work. Right? But I'd also say like that's, you're doing a small step in the door. So it's like you're being a substitute teacher. And then it's like, it's so much easier if they've seen you five, 10, 50 times to now hire you as full time. So it's like mm -hmm. anytime you're looking for a job, you want to figure out how can I get in at a small scale of just helping out here and there so they get actually a feel for me. And then for the most part, as long as you say please and thank you, you show up on time and you do what you say you're going to do, virtually any company will hire you on if they actually, you mean, you, you do those three things. Right. With trades, like the buy-in is also small. Like some programs legitimately like six weeks of classes. Mm -hmm. You have a little test. If you pass, you're good to go. You can have a certain color seal. You present that to an employer and say, like, I'm trying to build hours. And they'll hire you. You know, it's not like university where, like, my first two years at university were, like, what am I doing? Like, why like, why am I taking these courses? How do they kind of add and contribute to what I'll be doing as a teacher? And throughout my entire university period, like, next to none of that was even useful. Maybe, like, learning how to write. 
although nobody taught me that in university. I kind of like just deduced how to do it all right. Um, right. And so looking into that buy-in as well is like, Trades have a very low buy-in. You can do one semester in one trade and then switch over to another one. You can do it multiple times. And there's also potential for a lot of creativity in the trades too. So like I watch a lot of concrete YouTube channels where they're like, you mean telling the story of, hey, I've got this job. Here's how I do it, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's like if you're, let's say, going into a trade or something like that, it's like you could actually start to pitch. Like, hey, how about I start a YouTube channel? How about I start recording, doing some more creative work? And so you can be getting paid a good wage as well as getting to like experiment with how do I do YouTube, how do I do video, video editing, all these kind of skills. And then you can come out five, 10 years, not just with, you mean electrician, whatever, but you could actually come out as an accomplished YouTuber and be able to do whatever you want after that. And to me, it's like, it's a very easy way to be like, Hey, I'm getting paid. Cause that's one of the toughest parts in being a creative person. But then you add kind of like these creative skills that you get to learn and then then you can kind of do whatever. Like that's kind of one of the things we talked about with Najib is that if he's building up his own YouTube ability and skill set five, 10, 20 years down the line, it's not just like, oh, I'm a teacher. And if I'm not a teacher anymore, what am I? It's like, hey, like I'm also a YouTuber and I could potentially go on and do an, a million different things as well because I've been building the skill in the backs on the side. Right, like one of my students, hopefully he watches this. He, he said, hey, Mr. K, like, I don't mean to offend you, but like, you know, like your videos get no views. Why do you keep making them? <laughs> right. It's so funny. And I said to him, I, I'm like, you know, he played soccer. And I'm like, Hey, like how many times you kick the ball? He has no idea. Right. How many times you score two times? Like, so why'd you kick the ball more than twice? Mm -hmm. And it's clicked in his head. Like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Like he had no response. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the same thing, it's uh, like just that constant, like what, another thing I'd say about the trades that, that I don't really like about my job, you know, I get called out on this by students sometimes. Like, I'm allowed to be very playful because of my personality in my job. And, like, my students are okay with that-ish. If you have any grievances, leave them in the comments. Um, <laughs> trades as well. Like, you can be very playful. Like, some of the stories I hear my cousin tell me, you think, wow. Like, I wish I had a quarter of that much fun in university. Right? Like, some of the stuff they, some of the trouble they got into, some of the things they did. Like, they were really having a lot of fun in their time while they were learning. Now, all these guys still got their certificates, their seals, they know how to do their work, but they developed this bond through, and especially for young men, developing that bond through actually doing something, like mm -hmm. physically productive. It's very important, right? Um, I don't know how much that matters for women. It's slightly different, so I won't comment on that. But, you know, if you're someone who's very social, very enthusiastic, like working sometimes in an office environment can just be hell. Cause it's like, everyone expects you to be prim proper and do the work. Right. Whereas if you're very extroverted and you want to be around people and you want to have some socializing, like trades also gives you an opportunity where you can have that as well while you're getting paid. Which well, is the bigger difference I'd say with trades is that trades is much more based on the work of actually doing something. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'd say a lot of other jobs are much more on the relational side of like, do people like you? Does the boss like you and stuff like that? And it can be very infuriating. Um, if you're especially a low politeness person is like, it's much easier. Like, Hey, did I do the job? Right. You mean, you mean pay me like whatever. And we just focus on that. But with a lot of jobs, it's like, it's just the interpersonals and did you hurt anybody's feelings and stuff like that. And it can be very tough and in particular for guys to kind of manage those situations. Mm -hmm. It's true. Like, I, I don't think as many guys are as enthusiastic or playful as I am. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to talk about with trades? No, I think that's good. I think there's maybe one more slide. No, this is it. Um, well, so that wraps up the conversation, but this does kind of kick off a series where I will be talking to various people. Like Trent and I are going to do one on just how to have your own personal business, how to start your own business and doing an interview on that. Because, you know, a lot of people will tell you to move away from that. Like, you know, they'll probably even tell you to move away from trades because there's a stigma around it. But... I think at the end of the day, you got to consider like one, you got to be humble and recognize that like, you don't really know a lot either about yourself or about the world and how to proceed through it. Uh, recognize that a lot of people focus solely on career and money as well. They're not really talking about like enjoyability. Like I had so many people as I was going through my ed program tell me like, Oh, Najib, there's no money in education. It's like, All right, man. Like 
Thank you. But I'm not just concerned about money. Like I, I really enjoy going into work and enjoy seeing the people. And when they improve, it's like, oh, that's awesome. Right. So consider that there's a lot you don't know. And the only way to find out sometimes is by experimenting. Right. There's only so much you can learn from books. Yep. And there's only so much you can learn from other people. Sometimes you really got to walk the walk. Right. But best of luck. If you made it this far, leave a comment, share this with your friends. Peace out.